Hey, we're here with the crew trying to help out another family. If you look behind me, the, a new river basically formed right here. We took out a huge chunk of the land. And right now we're just trying to help remove some items from the shed so that we can remove the mud from inside the shed. And also any kind of debris that got damaged, we send out front and the city comes and collects it. So we're here trying to finish off the day with whatever left we can do. Our announcement period this morning is a little bit longer, but that's okay. We need to inform you of another exciting ministry that's happening. In fact, Elsie here is, is here to tell us more about the VBS program. First of all, what is VBS? Um, so VBS is a program for kids that happens during the summer. It's a week-long program where they can come and just enjoy and learn more about God. Vacation Bible School, right? We do this every year, and last year we were able to do it even during COVID, and now that uh, we have less restrictions, I we have even I more that we're able to do. So what are we doing this year? Is it muted? Oh, sorry. That's probably my fault. That's okay. Oh, there we go. I can hear myself. Um, yes, so we are very excited. I'm very excited. First of all, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Elsie. I am uh, Pastor Max's wife, and we just moved here recently in August, and there was a lot of tears shed when we left, but we are very excited to be a part of a new family as we just transferred our membership here, which is very exciting for us. And so I... Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I am the director for VBS for this uh, 2022 year, and I'm very excited about it because actually for the last two years, from what I've been talking to with other people, there was a lot of limitations because of COVID. Um, so it was quite smaller. It was also held online on one year. Um, and so we know that for kids, that's not as fun as doing things in person. So this year, we're really hoping to ramp it up and actually make the program as high to its potential as it actually can, because it's actually an amazing program. So just for like brief, so you guys briefly know what's going on, um, we're hoping to host it July 11th to the 16th, and the theme is We Are Treasured by God, and it's actually the Jasper Canyons. So that is the theme for this year, so if you've never been to Jasper, come to VBS. You will experience Jasper Canyons there. Um, and so we are hoping to get volunteers. So this is the biggest thing that we are um, starting with. VBS is in three months, so if you have nothing to do during the summer, and want to come have some fun with some Let, kids. That even if you do have something to do, cancel it and come to VBS, all right? Sure. And get involved. Just cancel and come because it is amazing ministry. It really is an amazing ministry. And like I think, I think as a church family, we really need to recognize that the children really are the future of the church. And so investing into them, putting time into them is such an important thing so that they can really experience God and understand their own relationship with God, right? Outside of just sitting in church with their parents. So um, if you feel like in your heart that you would like to volunteer, we are going to meet after church, right after church, we're gonna meet in the back room and I'll give you guys a bit more information on how you can volunteer. If right now you are saying, no, 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 I don't you know, do children's programs, I don't you know, talk at the friends, I don't do this, stop right there because there are a lot of volunteer positions for the background. You can be just a photographer, you can be just a media person who's doing the sound system. Um, there's decorators, we need a lot of decorators because there's a lot that goes into actually putting things up and taking things down. So please, please, please just consider it because this is definitely not a one-man show. I definitely can't do this alone. Um, it's definitely a group effort of at least 20, 30 volunteers. So the more we have, the merrier. So 
just consider it. And uh, like I said, if you want to volunteer, we'll meet in the back room. So right after church, we're going to meet in that room, right? Yes. And you'll direct us and tell us what we need to do. Yes. Okay. Consider signing up. Thank you. Hi there. I am here with my good friend Jim. We are here in Merritt at the Merritt Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we just want to update you and let you know the amazing work that this church is doing and that Jim and his team of volunteers have been doing for quite some time. Jim, what do you do here? Uh, I do what the, our amazing God gives me an opportunity to do because if anything's amazing, it's God and God in His grace. And you know, the people are attracted and brought here by the Spirit of God. And we pray for them and we ask God's Spirit to go right into their homes after they leave here. We begin our program with prayer and we end our program with prayer because this is a prayer-driven program and God's in the center of it. So you guys receive a, a vast amount of food from uh, the food bank and other areas and donors that contribute food. And you actually feed a lot of the needy individuals that are here, families that are in need, Tell us more about that. Well, actually, it's this year I bought a, a scale of them weighing things and finding out and keeping numbers. And, you know, we do in excess of 200 meals every month. Wow. And that's quite fun. And we did over, let's see, uh, somewhere around um, 1,800 pounds of food that we gave away last year. I mean, 18,000 pounds of food, I'm sorry. Praise the Lord. We, we get sometimes... Uh, from food banks and other sources, as much as uh, 800 pounds of food at a time. Yeah. No shortage of people that need it. Oh, wow. Well, Jim, take us through a quick walkthrough and uh, and show us what, how, how your system works here. Okay. Um, you have to get a bag and you start filling the bag. I think you might want to do that. All let's right, go. let's go. All right. Here we go. Jim, is this your team? Yeah. Wow. These are all volunteers. Look at that boy. You have sandwiches and. Oh, yeah. We can have sandwiches. We have soup. Chicken noodle soup. We're we're a little late, so they're they're giving out they've given out quite a bit already. So Jim, tell us you, you have some clothing in the back here too. You give away a lot of clothing too. Have any trouble our Lord cannot fix. Yeah, I know you have a lot of uh, various items that we do. One of the programs that the community has allowed us to have is what they call the Winter's Wear program, in which we have been provided with lots of warm coats and stuff. There are very few we have because it's the end of the winter. But we have given away hundreds and hundreds of uh, various articles of winter wear, winter clothing, and also lots of new items. Most of them, that, uh, many of them, had the price tags still on them and the tags there. So really excited to be able to give that, that level of that quality of things. People will come in and they enjoy it. We typically do have something for them, uh, clothing for them. But mainly it's the food and it's the spiritual. We also have an opportunity to pray with the people and we do that as much as we can. And they're starting to catch on. They were pretty shy at first, but now many of them will pray with us. Well, that's intriguing. We have uh, a mission story for Merit, which is a little different than we're used to, and that's great. So it's nice to have a lot of things happening, not only for our church and within our conference. In Philippians 4.19, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And that applies in not just giving, but in outreach, in our contacts, and in our lives. So I welcome you here this morning. I hope that you are blessed and that you participate with your heart and your voice as we praise God together. One thing I would like to uh, also share again and clarify on, we have a baby shower coming up on April 10th for Nara, Arietta, and baby Sarah, and Nara, could I ask you to stand, please, so that people know, and you can just sort of wave and let us know. <laughs> Thank you. There they are. Thank you so much. So we would love to have uh, ladies, and I'm sure 
men as well will be welcome to the baby shower April 10 between 3 and 5. Thank you so much for that. Um, why don't we just bow our heads as we seek the Lord as we begin our service. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the way you bless us in our lives by the grace and the mercy and the time and the spur of faith that you initiate in our hearts and that you flame uh, and you inflame by our association with fellow believers and by the substance of your word. We pray that your presence will be here today as we worship you. We pray that you will be with our speaker, with uh, Pastor Mike, or Brother Michael, not Pastor Michael, but Lord, please bless him and please bless every individual that's involved in this service. May we honor you and may you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We just want to let you know that you are very welcome here. And despite how it may look, our church is messy. We are authentically broken. Sometimes we're alone. Sometimes we feel down. And we just want you to know that we're happy you're here. If you had an argument on the way to church today, it happens. We're happy you're here. If you're here because you didn't want to come, but somebody coerced you to come, we're glad you're here. Uh, we hope you guys are really blessed with the service today and with the Sabbath. And um, we're going to start with singing In the Garden and Wonderful Peace. We've done this one before, but for those of you who haven't uh, joined us before, it's just the verse of In the Garden with the chorus of Wonderful Peace.
we're going to go back and sing one of the oldies, but the good, they're all goodies. Um, where no one stands alone. You know, I honestly think that there is nothing worse than being alone or feeling like you're alone. And one of the wonderful byproducts of having a Seventh-day Adventist church is that you're never alone. You can go anywhere in the world and you have an extended family. Just when I need him most 
Just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most, just when I need him, Jesus is strong, bearing my burdens all the day long. Pour out my sorrow, giving a song. Just when I need him most, just when I need him. Most. group. This morning our offering is for Reach BC. Earlier we saw items regarding merit, when we consider VBS, when we consider people being housed at Camp Hope, all of those things come under Reach BC. When you contribute to the offering today, Reach BC is an effort by the BC Conference to reach people for Jesus. So we, as we ask the uh, ushers to please come forward, we'd like to have a prayer. Thank you, let's just bow our head. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for giving us the privilege of being able to contribute to your work. As we read in Philippians, Lord, you are, have on bountiful resources that can bless and make your uh, will be done within this world. And so we have the opportunity to be able to be part of that. Thank you for including us. We know that through eternity that will be a key element of what um, will develop. Thank you for including us. Thank you for giving us the resources and the means that you have done so that we can contribute our tithes and our offerings to further your work here. Please bless this offering, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we contribute this offering, we ask the children to come forward, and there are baskets here so you can pick them up. The children were picking up an offering that will go towards the chaplaincy at Fraser Valley Adventist Academy. Thank you.
Thank you, boys and girls, to come this morning. You know, I'm very, very proud of something. What? Oh, yeah? And you know what it is? That your parents brought you here to church, especially to go to Sabbath school. And now that you are come to church service, but you know what? I, when I was your age, what I used to do in Sabbath school and enjoy the most? To tell the teacher all that I did all week long and to quote the memory verse for the week. Do you do that? Does anybody, does any of you do that? Yes? You, do you know it? No? Any of you? No? Oh. Go home and study it. Yes. But I'm here today to tell you a story. There was something I wanted. Can any of you guess? Or what is there that you would like to have? Anybody tell me? What? My name is David. Yes. Is it? What? My name is Oh. That's the mirror. Well, yeah. But I would like to know what you would like to have. Yes? A dog. A kitty. Oh, yes. Yeah. Jesus? Thank you. That was very nice of you. Chickens? Chickens, oh, yes. It was something I wanted. And any of you could guess what it was? Jesus. Jesus, yes. Yes. That is one thought. Well, Hannah is here, and she's going to give you a little quick look at something I wanted. And that was a horse. A horse. I begged and I begged and I begged my parents for a horse. Then one spring, they went out and bought me a horse. And I called that horse Sandy. I grew to love that little horse, that horse. And do you know, at the same time, my parents bought me a bridle. What, do you, what is a bridle used for? ride the horse. Yes, it is. Yes, it is what you put in the horse's mouth to control the horse. And at the same time, they bought me a saddle. You know what the saddle is for? To sit on and ride. Yes, that is exactly right. And you know, when they did that, they also asked me to do something. And that was never to ride this horse on the Sabbath day. Please do not ride the horse on the Sabbath day, they asked me. And I said, yes, I would. I'd never ride the horse on the Sabbath day. I promised him that. You win. And I, all summer long, I practiced riding the horse, and I thought I grew to know how to ride the horse very, very well. Then one Sabbath day, I slowly walked out to the pasture where Sandy was standing and eating grass. And I petted her. Oh, what a nice soft hair she had on her. And a thought came to me. Why don't you ride her? Oh, no, it is the Sabbath day. I don't ride on the Sabbath day. Yeah, but you have seen people or children, young people even, Riding a horse without a saddle and a bridle. Why don't you? No, but you can just sit on her. And that is what tempted me. And I said, I crawled up onto Sandy. And as I sat there, just as I sat down on her, she took off running. And she came up to a gate. And the gate was open and turned swiftly into the gate. And I went flying off of Sandy, and hit the ground, thud. And I screamed, ouch. 
I was in pain. I didn't know why my arm hurt so badly. So I ran quickly to my parents and told them and showed them. My father looks at my arm and he says, you have broke your arm. My mother looked at me and says, isn't it the Sabbath day that you promised not to ride the horse on? Isn't it? We must get you immediately to the doctor, they said. So they took me in, and the doctor looks at it and says, I must put a cast on that arm immediately. So they put a cast on. Do you know what a cast is? Yes? The picture is, shows the uh, picture of it there. And the doctor put it on, and you know, I thank the Lord for many years after, even when I was young, of that, what Jesus allowed the Satan to do is break my arm on the Sabbath day because it, why many temptations came to me afterwards to disobey my parents, but I always thought of that situation where I broke my arm. What? Because of disobedience. And that is what it says in the Bible. Please honor your parents and keep your word to what you have said. Always honor your parents. And you know, my parents, because they love Jesus, they wanted me to live happily. And that's how you can live happily when you go home and honor your parents. Okay? Thank you all for coming. Goodbye.
Good morning, church. Our scripture reading today is found in Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the surging mountains quake with their surging. Would those who are able please kneel with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us safely here this Sabbath morning. Thank you for all the blessings that you give us and for answered prayers. Thank you for Jesus who came to die for us so that we can have eternal life with him. Please forgive us of our sins. Please be with those who cannot be with us today. Help them to know that you are with them in a special way. We pray for your people around this world and for everyone here today. We ask that your Holy Spirit will reach out and touch the heart of the people searching for you. You know each of our needs, and we pray that you will provide for our needs according to your will. Bless our speaker, Michael Ma, as he shares your message with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad you're here today. <laughs> the ledge. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, I just ask that today you would stand up here instead of me, and that your words would be spoken and not mine, and that people would see you. I give myself to you, Lord, and ask that you'd use me. And that you would bless these people here as they see a clearer picture of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. On December 21, 2003, postgraduate students Marnie Shepherd and Sonia Rendell set out for a three day hike through Arthur's Pass National Park in southern New Zealand. Sonia had recently split up with her boyfriend and was looking forward to getting away to think about the direction of her life. Her older friend, Marnie, was an experienced climber and had encouraged Sonia to come along with her on the 60-kilometer journey. Sonia had never hiked with Marnie before and had relatively little experience, but she trusted Marnie's expertise, and so they set out. The sky was blue and sunny, and they enjoyed the beautiful scenery surrounding them. However, on the morning of the second day, they they encountered something totally unexpected while hiking through a canyon pass, a massive wall of winter ice and snow, four to five stories high, standing in front of them. It completely blocked their way. Shocked but not wanting to turn back, Marnie evaluated the situation and suggested that they could climb up the bluffs on the left side and try to get past the ice. Following her friend's advice, Sonia followed Marnie as they began the ascent, even though Sonia had no climbing experience whatsoever. Marnie was confident that the climb would not be too difficult. As they finally reached the ridge, they stared over it towards a very steep, uncrossable avalanche gully before them. Undaunted, Marnie believed that they could continue climbing higher to the next ridge and hopefully find a way around that too. So putting her faith in her friend once more, 
Sonia followed on, despite the climb being much steeper and more challenging. However, as they ascended higher, Sonia became more concerned. There were fewer proper handholds, and the rocks were proving unstable. She looked down and saw that it was a near vertical drop below her. She panicked and wanted to turn back, but Marnie informed her that it was too dangerous to turn around now. They must keep going up. Sonia pressed on, and after hours of climbing, they found themselves 200 meters up the cliff face. Suddenly, Sonia lost her grip, and her body started sliding downwards rapidly. She let out a scream as her body flew over a cliff edge. Amazingly, her hands managed to grasp onto part of the rock as she fell, bringing her to a stop. Marnie carefully maneuvered down to her from above. She reached out her hand and pulled Sonia upwards until she could regain her footing. From there, they slowly made their way to a small, exposed ledge. At this point, Sonia was terrified. She would not go on. Despite Marnie's coaxing, she wouldn't budge. Fear of falling again paralyzed her. Reluctantly, Marnie agreed to stay that night on the ledge, but she planned for them to attempt another climb in the morning. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? No? Okay. Let me switch to this. Testing. Hello? Can you hear me? I wonder if Satan doesn't want us to hear this today. <laughs> Pulpit mic? Let's do that. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Total failure of the sound system. <laughs> there we go. I think I'm coming back. All right. Where were we? On the ledge. So they were going to stay there overnight until the morning. However, that night, a storm front moved in. Heavy rain constantly poured down upon them, making any further climbing attempt nearly impossible. The ledge they were on barely fit the two of them, and they huddled together under their sleeping bags to keep warm. But the rain soon soaked through everything. The weather did not clear, but only worsened over the next few days, turning to sleet and snow. Their food supplies ran out, leaving them with only a small amount of dehydrated mashed potatoes and snow to eat and drink. Trench foot set in, swelling their feet painfully. Fearing death by hypothermia, they forced themselves to stay awake day and night, even slapping each other and yelling at each other to prevent themselves from going to sleep. Sonny, Sonia and Marnie would remain on this ledge for eight days, with so, seemingly no way of escape. You know, I first heard about this story several years ago, and for some reason it's stuck with me ever since. Perhaps because if I look back over my own life, I can recall several experiences that foster a certain level of fear in me when it comes to precarious heights. As a child, I once fell out of a tall tree and landed on, of all things, a large sink. I know, who puts a sink under a tree? I did, actually. <laughs> it was our fort. <laughs> thought it was kind of cool. Let's just say the back of my head did not appreciate meeting the sink's faucet handles. That hurt. In university, I was assigned to accompany a saxophonist on the piano for a year. However, the following summer, while camping with friends, he decided to head out one night alone and play his saxophone at the edge of a cliff overlooking the valley. He didn't come back. After a search, they found his body and the saxophone at the bottom of the cliff. In my 20s, while hiking along the seashore, I decided to climb up the side of a small cliff to meet up with some of my friends who were up on the ridge above. I didn't think the cliff was that high or steep, but halfway up I realized I had greatly misjudged things. 
I had to fight feelings of panic. I knew I was in over my head, and at any moment I could fall and seriously injure myself. I didn't know how I managed to get to the top of that ridge, but somehow I did. I'm still here, and I thank my angel for that. So I can certainly relate to the fears of height, heights that Sonia succumbed to. I have no problem climbing ladders, but you won't find me dangling my feet off the top of a tall building or skydiving or bungee jumping. The idea of those things sends a wave of panic over me. Fear. We're all familiar with it, especially over the last few years. But there's a lot more to this story than just an amazing tale of survival. You see, the long, for the longest time, I was really struggling to know what to preach today. I kept praying, and it seemed like nothing was coming together. Finally, my wife and I both prayed together, and that night, God brought this story back to my memory, and I started to see it in a new way, in a spiritual way. For many, the, the journey of faith often starts off very well. Blue, sunny skies all around. We're basking in God's love, and everything seems so bright and beautiful. But then something unexpected happens. We're confronted by a challenge that seems almost impossible to overcome. A wall of ice, if you will. Maybe it's a particular sin you find hard to give up. Or an attack on your spiritual understanding. Or some other difficult life event that takes you by surprise. Our journey grinds to a halt and we look around bewildered. However, not all hope is lost. We recall the promise in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We look up and God reveals the way to victory. And off we go, putting our faith into action. But as we continue climbing up the narrow way, we soon discover that the higher we go, the more challenging things become. Our faith is tested repeatedly, sometimes severely, As I thought about this, I wondered what causes some Christians to lose their faith and fall away, while other Christians manage to keep it intact and even strengthen it by the adversity they're facing. I found the answer in the parable of the sower. In Luke 8, 13, it says, But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root who believe for a while and in a time of temptation fall away. Faith needs roots. If you can recall, what was one of the things Sonia encountered that began to strike fear in her heart as she was climbing up the rock face? She looked down, that's true. But the first thing she encountered was loose rocks. When most people think of a rock, they typically think of something firm, solid, reliable. Spiritually speaking, I see these solid rocks as representing the promises in God's word. We reach out with our hands and in faith grasp hold of those rocks, believing that we can put our full weight on them. We can continue climbing upwards. But what if you grabbed onto a rock and it shifted? And then you grabbed onto another and it crumbled in your hand? Concern, doubt, a bit of fear and panic would likely start to set in. But these loose rocks don't represent God's promises. Instead, they represent Satan's lies, which he so cleverly makes to look like something worth grabbing onto. A lie of the devil, mistaken for a promise of God, can be a very damaging thing to faith. This is why we need to study God's word for ourselves and not just do it occasionally when we tire of scrolling through Facebook and Instagram. According to Jesus, we need it more than we need food. Plants that don't take root in soil typically die. And Christians that don't take root in the word of God won't last much longer either. Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if you never or rarely read the Bible, how will you know for sure that what you're hearing is actually from the word of God and not just some apparent truth that somebody's making up? And without that kind of personal experience in his word, your faith will not take root. You'll have shaky faith, the kind that gets tossed to and fro, 
and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, as the Apostle Paul so eloquently puts it in Ephesians 4.15. Satan is a cunning deceiver. He can present darkness as light, and if you don't know God's word, then how will you be able to tell the difference? Instead, you'll start to think it was really a bad idea to climb up this way. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe this isn't the right path to be on. And then, what too often happens is you look down. King David struggled with this as have many of God's followers throughout history. In Psalm 40, verse 12, he wrote, For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. Sounds like a spiritual attack, don't you think? David is feeling overwhelmed. The last part of the verse, my heart fails me is almost identical to Jesus' own words in Luke 21, verse 26, where he describes men's hearts failing them for fear during the last days. When you're high up on a cliff, surrounded by loose rocks, looking down will make you afraid. And what is David focusing on in this verse? Innumerable evils, his iniquities, his dark sins. When we as Christians encounter trials, temptations, doubts, and even personal failures in our life, the natural tendency is to not look up at Christ, but to look down at ourselves, our past mistakes, our many flaws and faults. It's an overwhelming sight to behold. How can someone like me ever be saved? We tell ourselves, I'm not good enough. I'll never make it. The climb is too hard. Discouragement and fear set in. You know, in a study conducted in 2019, the Barna Group discovered that 64% of Christian young adults ages 18 to 29 were leaving the church. This is known as the church dropout rate, and the trend is not good. That's a 5% increase from the study done eight years prior. Compare that to the high school dropout rate in the USA for the same year, which was only 5.1%. That's a big difference. 64% of young adults are leaving church but only about 5% are leaving high school. This is despite an increase in pizza parties, video game nights, trendy music hosted by church youth groups. But after reviewing the statistics, it seems to me that when a person's faith is challenged, when they grab onto a loose rock, when they get overwhelmed by sin, when they look down, the thing that will keep them from falling away isn't the next church social event, though those are important. It's having a personal relationship with Jesus that is grounded in the word of God. I remember when I was younger, there was a period of a few years where almost all of my friends left the church I was attending. Most went off to college, or some moved away, but others just dropped out. Occasionally, one or two in my age range might show up for part of the service. But quite, for quite a while, I would go to church, and it was literally just me, a bunch of old people, no offense, <laughs> adults, and little kids, just me. I have to ask myself, why did I keep going? I had, you know, growing up in this world and being bombarded with the secular influences and temptations, I was even attending a secular university. I had every reason to walk away from the church that had nothing going on for someone in my age range. We didn't even have pizza or trendy music at my church. But I kept going because I wanted to. No one was forcing me. I went to church every week because I actually genuinely loved Jesus. I wanted to serve him, and I was reading the Bible and praying, so my faith was grounded. It would be nice to think that I never looked down, but there were times that I did. As a young person, I struggled with sin and temptation, as we all do, and at times fear would set in. I wondered if I would just slide down and fall away. Sin can be a big monster to tackle, as I'm sure you're aware, especially when you're young. But then my hand found a solid rock to grasp onto, 
And that gave me the courage to look up, to see beyond the fear and look into the face of the one who gave everything for me. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, your, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I will never leave you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. I can't tell you how many times I had to recall those verses and many more to help me overcome my spiritual fears. God's promises are exactly what is needed when you're looking down the cliff. But not everybody manages to cling to God's promises when faced with intense fear. What happens when a Christian is overwhelmed by the attacks of the enemy and their faith sinks and their spiritual fears become so paralyzing they can't just go on? This type of fear can lead to panic and panic leads to irrational thoughts and actions. You look for the nearest ledge to escape to. Anything to get off this terrifying cliff. Climbing any further is out of the question. And so you huddle down on the ledge, trying to tune out the reality around you, that you're literally hundreds of meters up a mountain with no easy way to get off. It's a deadly drop below you and a seemingly impossible climb above you. But the ledge doesn't offer any real safety. It's a trap an illusion of escape, a sort of spiritual prison. Are you stuck on a ledge today? Perhaps there's a hidden sin in your past, and the thought of confessing it paralyzes you with fear. Think of what you might lose if you reveal the truth, your job, maybe a close relationship, or the respect of others. The ledge doesn't look so bad in comparison, or so you think. Or maybe you're angry at God. How could he allow this to happen to you? You've suffered a terrible loss and he seems silent. Doesn't he care? You're crying. And you feel so alone. Where is he? Or perhaps you've been struggling for years to overcome a weak point in your character. But you feel like you've made almost no progress. In fact, you seem worse than before. It's been an exhausting journey. Why won't God give you the righteousness and perfection that he promised? It just seems like a never-ending climb. The doubts and the fears creep in and keep you in bondage on the supposed safety of the ledge. However, life isn't easy on the ledge. Guilt, bitterness, doubts, and anger eat away at your faith and slowly chip away at your interest in spiritual things. You don't read the Bible like you used to, and your prayer life starts to dry up. It's like running out of food. Since you're no longer exercising your faith, your muscles cramp up and your feet swell. Then the rains come and they keep coming. The warmth of God's peace is swept away and a cold emptiness settles in. You're at risk of spiritual hypothermia. So if life on the ledge is so bad, Why do so many people choose to stay there? Why don't they call out to God for help? I believe the real reason is because our perspective of God has changed. In Ezekiel 18.20, God gave us a warning. The soul that sins, it shall die. Hebrews 2.15 then goes on to describe those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now the answer is becoming clear. Fear of death keeps us in bondage on the ledge. And because we've sinned against God, we now associate him with that fear. And what do you do when you're afraid of someone? You hide. 
And no wonder our first parents set the example for us. In Genesis 3, 8 to 10, this is what it says. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and Eve and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now when God asked, where are you? Notice how Adam did not respond. He didn't say, hey, I'm over here in the bushes. That's because God wasn't asking for the GPS coordinates of Adam and Eve. He knew where they were. It seems to me that God was asking them, why has your perspective of me changed? Where are you looking from now that you see me as a threat instead of someone to love and trust? Remember, God doesn't change. The Bible is clear on that. In Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This really got me thinking. When Marnie and Sonia first encountered the massive ice wall in the valley they were hiking through, they realized it would be impossible for them to climb over it. Another way must be found. They looked up to the rock running along the side of the ice and realized this was their path to salvation. So they put their faith into practice and began climbing. Now don't miss this. They were not afraid of the rock when they first started out. In fact, they viewed it in a positive way, as their only hope. But something changed as they climbed higher. They began to encounter challenges and difficulties that they didn't expect, and this led to doubt. Then the same rock that appeared before as a path to salvation was now not so much. In Sonia's eyes, it was something against them, something to fear. When it comes to fear and faith, perspective is everything. This is why Romans 14.23 says that whatever is not of faith is sin, because sin indicates a change in how you view God. You found some reason to start doubting that he really loves you. The prophet Isaiah describes this change of perspective toward God that took place among the Israelites. In Isaiah 8, 13 to 15, it says, The Lord of hosts, him shall you hallow. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. The original Hebrew definition for these words translated as fear and dread is not what you think it is. If you look at it, instead it means that we should view God with awe-inspiring reverence and have confidence in his majesty and power. And if you think about it, this makes perfect sense when you read the next sentence. He will be as a sanctuary. A sanctuary is somewhere people go when they are seeking safety. God is our protector. He is the ultimate sanctuary for us. And if he is with us, who or what can be against us? But what if you stopped believing that he's for you? That's where the second part of these verses kick in. The same God is now viewed as a trap, a snare, something that will cause stumbling and falling, a rock of offense, an enemy, someone to be afraid of. The Apostle Peter fleshes this out a little bit more, referencing these same verses in 1 Peter 2, verse 7 and 8. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word. Did you catch that? The reason some people view God as someone who is precious rather than someone to flee from in terror is because they believe that God actually loves them. And this faith in God's love manifests itself in obedience to whatever God says. You know, my final conclusion is this. If someone truly believes that God loves them, they obey him no matter what the cost is to themselves. And if someone 
conversely, doesn't believe God, doesn't believe that God loves them, they will disobey him no matter what the cost is to themselves. Think about it. The Bible is chock full of examples from history demonstrating both cases. Abraham offering his only son Isaac on the altar. Gideon attacking the vast Midianite army with only 300 men. Three Hebrews being thrown into a fiery furnace. They all overcame fear by their faith. Their faith that God loved them. But then there's also Pharaoh who was willing to have his whole kingdom destroyed and even the life of his son taken away rather than obey God's voice. And what about all the wicked at the end of time who continue disobeying God even after seven horrific plagues that they suffer through? Imagine that. Imagine having a fear so great that you think God hates you so much that you would rather endure the agony of these plagues then consider the possibility that he actually loves you and is trying to save you. You know, the patriarch Job declared, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job had lost all fear of death. The ledge had no power over him. His perspective of God was that God loved him. And this knowledge was greater than anything, even greater than comfort and health, and family, and wealth, and even his own life. He could suffer through the loss of all these things, and his faith in God's love for him would still be enough. That's what real faith looks like. It has no limits, because God's love for us has no limits. 1 John 4.18 sums it up. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out all fear. After eight days, stuck on a ledge, an amazing thing happened to Sonia and Marnie. The sun came out and the rain stopped. Though exhausted, hungry, and in pain, they decided that they had had enough of the ledge. They stood up, gathered their things, and prepared to climb. Their will to find a better existence overcame their fear of the mountain. Suddenly, oh, can someone go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Suddenly, a miracle happened. A helicopter appeared in the distance. It seemed so small and far away, but it kept getting closer. Come higher, come higher, they yelled into the air. And it finally did just that. Incredibly, inside the chopper were Sonia's sisters and Marnie's sister, Gina. After searching for days for the lost hikers and hope fading, one of the search and rescue pilots offered to take the three sisters into the air and let them see the terrain that Marnie and Sonia had vanished into, perhaps to say a final goodbye. But there would be no goodbyes today. Sonia and Marnie hugged each other as their sisters in the helicopter erupted with surprise and joy. A short while later, the rescue helicopter landed at the search base, and the two lost and found hikers were surrounded by crowds of family and friends and searchers rejoicing over them. Marnie, on a stretcher, looked over at her sister Gina and said with regret, It's all my fault. I was the cause of all this trouble. But Gina replied to her, it doesn't matter. You're safe. That's all. Today, if you find yourself stuck on a ledge, I want you to know that there is a God who loves you. And he left the 99 sheep behind to go searching for you. All of heaven is part of the great rescue mission to help find you and bring you back home safely again. You don't need to be afraid anymore. God's love is greater than your fears. So lift up your head. Look into his face and believe that he is really for you and not against you. Believe that he is even with you on that ledge just like he has been with you as you were climbing. 
He's trying with all his grace and love to help you see him in the darkness, to know that he is your friend, that he hasn't given up on you. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zeboim? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. He has done and will continue to do whatever it takes to help you see his great love for you. And when he finally gets hold, when he finally gets to hold you in his arms, and you weep before him for all the suffering that you've caused his heart, he's going to wipe away your tears and say this, it doesn't matter. You're safe. That's all. For those of you who don't have a phone, I was an Amber Alert um, being issued by Fort St. John for a child that's gone missing, a four-year-old little boy. Um, we're going to close with 522. My hope is built on nothing less. Please stand. search and rescue person and we've just learned that there is a child missing and you specialize in finding people so we ask Lord that you would bless that search and you would help the people find and bring home that child safely but Lord if there's anybody here today that is lost or feeling lost or distanced from you I pray Lord that you would reveal your love to them Help them to have a change of perspective and to see 
that you love them, that you're for them, and that you're doing everything you can to rescue them. Help us to remember this, Lord. Help us to remember your incredible love. And as we go through this week, Lord, make us a blessing to others and encourage each other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.